So we're gonna look a little bit closer at measurements, uh, what they look like, in some manners, what they should look like, okay? As the age old saying in wood shop, measure twice, cut once. Because if you cut it short, you either have to make completely redo your project or cut again on a different board and that costs money. So talking about how to make good measurements. Yesterday, uh, activity had you making approximations, but then making some measurements. And we'll use those as examples as we go forward. So first off, we have to understand that no measurement is exact. Even if we measure twice, we're going to find that each measurement has a certain amount of uncertainty with it. Okay? Meaning it's not going to be super spot on. Now, a topic that I know uh, previous, uh, your, most people had in ninth grade that uh, would help. Um, and so, and that's the topic of significant digits or significant figures. Sometimes we shorten it up and just say sig figs. You probably heard that. We're not talking about thick newtons or anything like that. Um, or sig digs is another one. Significant figures or significant digits. How you talk, say it, or whatever you use with it, it doesn't really matter. Okay? What significant digits does allow us to use is that we have an arbitrary kind of ruler, so to speak, on the screen. With this ruler, we're able to make some good and use of our uh, measurements. So we say measure twice, cut once in the shop. Well, and that's even if you're in it, when we say in the shop, it doesn't all, uh, measuring does not only take place in a wood shop or a metal shop. It can also happen if you are a seamstress because you don't want to measure the person and make a bad measurement if you're a seamstress and make the clothing wrong. Kind of doesn't look really good on a number of different levels. If you are a hairdresser and they say take about six inches off and you take nine, usually that doesn't go well. The, the customer is not happy. Okay? And so measurements are important. We look at them more from a side of the measurements that we would make, say, in the uh, lab, because that's the class I'm teaching, and so that's where we go with it. Okay? And so what these look like is yesterday you were asked to write out, and let's use a different color here, um, dark green. To draw out five centimeters, or about two inches. And then you measured, and some of you found out, wow, that was definitely not two inches. Okay? And how you got there might be different. You know, when you measure that line, where that line is, starts at is not a good place. How do we know it's not a good place? Well, we can see the beginnings of the line does not start at exactly zero. You have two options. You can either A, move your ruler so that it starts at zero, or B, take into account that it doesn't start at zero and try to guesstimate that actually what line does it actually start at and then do some math to determine that. That seems more confusing and more places where we could potentially have error. We don't want that. 
It's like making a cut. Say you, uh, uh, I, I did some work over the, the summer and I need, I bought uh, 12 foot two by fours. Cause a lot of the cuts I was needing were around six feet long. I just buy that instead of buying a bunch of 10 footers, right? Now most 12 foot two by four are not actually 12, they're longer than 12. Yeah, which is nice. Because if there was exactly 12, and I wanted a six foot board, how many real six foot boards am I gonna get out of a straight up 12? No, I might get one. Because I'll get one, because after that, once you cut it, it takes a little bit off. And you can take, you can go to one side, and if you have an eighth inch blade on it, or a quarter inch blade, and you don't take that into account, all of a sudden your boards are gonna get smaller on one side, and things aren't gonna be square. That becomes a problem, especially if you've ever built something. One of the first times I built something, things were, did not look good. You know, there's projects out there that I call the crooked house project, and they're supposed to be crooked. I did not make it, uh, it was not supposed to be crooked the first time I did it. It just so happened to be that way. Because I didn't take into account that. And you're like, some people are like, how could you not do that? That was so easy. Never had wood when I was in high school. Never had shop class. Wasn't offered. Okay? So, everything I did was self-pop. A lot of YouTube. A lot of Pinterest reading, okay? A lot of projects that probably were, should have been cheaper than they actually were, okay? So best place to start that would be as close to that zero line as possible. Now, where does it end? How many of you would look at this line and say, eh, it's about four and a half and call her good? And to be honest to you, thank you. I appreciate some honesty. Didn't see any hand raising, so everybody that's virtual would uh, probably not have that. A lot of people would do that. They would look at that and say, eh, four and a half. Is it four and a half, though? No. No, it's not four and a half. You know, and then we start getting into the, okay, if it's not four and a half, what is it? And so now we have to be very mindful And there's a little bit of a gap. My blue line does not touch the green line completely, but we can definitely see on the ruler part, it's, it's past the four and a half, isn't it? It's actually probably closer to the 4.6, right? Now, is it right on 4.6? That becomes a great fun thing, and that's why we use significant digits, because we don't know where it exactly ends is it you know and where you measure it and this is where every individual who measures things is just a little bit different or you learn it from the person you were taught it by is it 4.61 or is it 4.59 and it's the that little bit that little bit extra is your first uncertain digit. We know it's not 4.5, it's probably around that 4.6, but where, on which side of that 4.6 is it? Is it right on 4.6 and that'd be 4.60? See, it's that last one, that last digit, you know, is it 4.59? That's our uncertainty digit. Is it, 4.60 point that means that zero is your uncertain or is it 4.61 that one is your uncertain digit you're not quite sure that's your guess okay and that's 
where we start looking at what significant digits are. It's that first uncertain digit that we have. Now, our scales don't actually even read this nicely, but I think it helps serve the purpose. That we say you have a scale that measures at 4.36 grams, and it has an uncertainty, meaning the best that it can do is plus or minus 0.01. Meaning whatever the scale actually reads, it could be on either side of that. And that's the uncertainty that we have. So the last uncertain digit is the 6 in that 4.36. It would make no sense for us to write out the number... And just add a whole bunch of zeros there. Because what you're telling the person in, that would be, say if you're uh, reporting this for something, you use a really awesome scale to go that far back. Okay? Chances are you don't. I have used one. that went that far back. Six decimals. It was intense. It was in a very expensive piece of equipment. Like $5,000 expensive for a scale. But, yeah, it, However, it might have been like a $5,000 piece of equipment, but we needed that. So some people are like, why would you need something like that? Because we were dealing with things that were really, really, really small in their amounts. So we needed that piece of equipment to be able to measure that significant, that far out. And therefore... It was important. Now, here's the other fun thing. We talk about how we make good measurements. You know, when you're measuring that far out, a person walking in the hallway can mess that up. Somebody running a vacuum can mess it up because it's fluctuations in the electricity. Static electricity meaning the particle size of the items that we were uh, measuring was small enough that just little, they would have a natural static electricity to them. They would just kind of, it would vary greatly. So we actually had to get an ionizer to, to take away the static electricity as I passed the solid into the scale. And you had to like close it up, not like vacuum seal it in, but it had to close it so that no air would pass through it. Because just little air currents, breathing, could affect it. And we had to make sure that that last zero or that last digit didn't move for 30 seconds. One day, it took me four hours of staring at a scale and a clock before that thing didn't move. Talk about watching paint dry. That was pretty intense because you didn't want to, and you couldn't go to lunch. You're like, oh, I'll just go get a cup of coffee because you didn't want to leave it and it stabilize and then leave. Then we found out there was probably some other factors involved on why it took so long. Static electricity and the particle size was too small and or, or was variable. So it is a big deal. How you make or where you make your measurements can matter. I mean, it's like why is a certain, uh, the why the tape measures have that, it's usually about two to three inches. You know, a lot of people just kind of whoop, bend it in the corner and guesstimate, right? But they always say, don't do that. 
put it right to the butt because then you just add the three inches. Some people are really good and can bend it and do a pretty reasonable job of, of uh, reading it. But it all, again, it's skill and your ability to make those measurements. For most of us, those zeros confuse us. They don't mean anything to us. There's no reason for them to be there. So why bother? You are overstating your significance. And those of you that have ever done any kind of fishing would say, I caught a fish this big. I thought you were fishing sunnies. It was this big. Really? That's a really big sunny. Okay, maybe it was this big. Right? And you always get those, oh, it was a whopper. You know, how big the fish store hands get increases as you uh, tell the story, right? Or I shot this buck that had a rack on it this big. That would be quite the massive. You would be in like deer hunter magazines. Okay? Especially if it wrapped around nicely too. Chances are you did it. It probably was something like this. Maybe didn't even have as many talent. You know, just that. Right? I can still remember the first deer I shot it was not that big but boy did it look big coming out of the brush right so those zeros are just that elaboration of how good we think that fish was or that deer was or how fast we actually maybe thought we were going but actually weren't going Oh, I was, I was super fast. I was sub, I ran sub 11 in the 100. Oh, really? Probably not, but it could, maybe you did. That's a possibility. But when you have celebrities, like I believe it was Britney Spears, said something about running like a six second 100 meter dash. I'm like, wow, that's impressive. Not even Usain Bolt does that. He was like a low to mid nine guy. There you go. We got you didn't know that a pop star needed to be a six second hundred meter dash. You know, so whatever you tell for your whoppers of a story can confuse some people sometimes. So here are some of the rules for well de determining whether or not zeros are significant and you will want to know these rules you will want to write down these rules if you haven't written down these rules and since you get to use your notes i can guarantee you having these rules handy when you get to use your notes on a test it would be a good idea to be able to reference them for that and being is that some of you have the notes in the skeleton form meaning all you would have to actually do is just kind of write down the examples and or some definition stuff that would be extremely valuable to you and if you don't aren't given them to you all of you have access to them on Schoology everybody has access to the skeleton notes okay all zeros are all non-zero digits are significant Meaning they mean something. All non-zero digits are significant. I like to use uh, kind of a, a cookie analogy. Non-zeros are like cookies. They're all significant. Regardless of whether it's an oatmeal and raisin it's still a cookie and darn it if that's the last one that you're gonna have if that's what you only can eat darn it I'll still eat an oatmeal and raisin cookie actually I prefer to eat the oatmeal and raisin cookies because nobody else likes them so therefore I get more 
It's like when it comes to the Starburst. Everyone's like, oh, I love the reds and the pinks. I'm like, give me the yellows and the oranges. I will eat those up because nobody else likes them and I get them all. Okay. Zeros between non-zeros are significant. They mean something. It's the filling in an Oreo. Some people say it's the best part. However, if you're, we're just gonna continue with our cookie analogy, it's still a part of the Oreo and it's a significant part of the Oreo. It's kind of added, so it's a flavor enhancer. Now, whether or not you open it up, scrape it off and eat it, most people don't throw away the other cookie part of it. They just eat it differently. Or maybe you grab two Oreos, scrape them off, twist them off, and combine, recombine them to make a bigger uh, icing part. By the way, double stuffed works best on that. That's basically what it is. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of the jumbo uh, stuffing. That's just a little bit too much icing for me. I'm still a big fan of the cookie part of it. Okay? But the nine and the six are your cookies. Why? It's your non-zero. A nine and a six. They're your non-zero. The zero is that in-between part of your cookie. The Oreo. The frosting part of the Oreo. After the first two, then we get into some kind of um, tougher ones. If the number in the decimal is between one and negative one, which means we're gonna deal with small numbers, okay? Those zeros before the first non-zero do not count. They are considered just placeholders because we can get rid of them using scientific notation, which we will talk about next week. Okay. There is a saying that we are going to uh, have. Part of it will pertain to this rule, and it is dot right, not left. These zeros do not count because they are what direction from the three? They are to the left of the three. Okay? Because they're to the left, they do not count. We can't just arbitrarily get rid of them. We have to still show the, the fact that we are dealing with a small number, and we do that using scientific notation. Again, we will talk about that later. Some of you might already know how to deal with that. Now, in the next example, we have those zeros are to the left of the one, but then we have this zero here, and what do we, does that zero count? Yes. Yes, because it's the sandwich zero. We got one is a cookie, six is a cookie. That zero in the middle between them, that's the frosting. It still means something to us. That's why we get three significant digits. All three of those are good. The other aspect of the 
dot right not left is the zeros to the right of a non-zero number. I like to think of these as the cookies with that little chocolate liner on the bottom. You might not think of it as very significant, but sometimes it's quite the enhancer. That little bit of chocolate on the bottom of the cookie or whatever they put up sometimes on the bottom. Where here we have some examples. We know that those two numbers, the nine and the three are cookie numbers. They mean something to us, they're non-zeros. This zero at the back end does matter. If we remember back to our earlier, earlier number that we made that measurement, it means something. That was our first guessing. That means the person that wrote down that number or wrote, uh, met, made that measurement said it, it was 0.93 and it was zero. If they were guessing on the three, they wouldn't put that zero. But that three on the back side matters because it's to the right of that not zero number, the last non zero number. Now, on the their next example, we have zeros all over the place. First zeros we have are on what side of our non-zero number? Right side? On the right side or are they on the left side? They're on the left. And we do not count the ones that are on the left. We can take those into account using scientific notation. We can get rid of them, so to speak. We know the five and the six count. Five and the six count. What about that zero in the middle? Yep, it counts. Now that last zero is what direction of our last non-zero digit? Right, and those do count. That one does count, so we count them up. If it helps, feel free to put little arrows above the non-zero numbers, and then your zeros, you can kind of see, okay, where's my zeros at? Is it in between my arrow? That means it means something. Does it on the right hand side? Then it means something. If I don't have any, those zeros aren't in between little arrows or little check marks or whatever it is to help me out, then they, we should get rid of them. They're, they're probably to the left. Okay. The fifth one is only is not one that I usually like to always have up. It is one that is a little bit odd. We don't see it used all that much. And so it can be kind of a, a trickier one. I had a former student basically say, so what you're saying is we can pretty much just make up numbers then? Not exactly, but yeah, within some reason, yeah. It really comes down to when you are making these measurements, and for me, as a scientist, reporting the measurements to other scientists, it's the communication that is there. They understand if I report a number that just says 100, such as the first example, that only has one significant digit. 
which would tell the reader they're not very confident in their measurements to report only one significant digit. If I said 100 point, that adds confidence because I'm adding significant digits by putting that decimal there. The last example. Okay. And so you have, you know, some of that, you know, the middle example has five significant digits. Why? Well, let's again, let's use our arrows. One, two, three, four, five. Those zeros on the back end, you don't have a decimal place, okay? Because do we have a dot in that middle example? No, no dot. So therefore, the dot right, not left, can't be used. There's no dot. There's no decimal place. Therefore, I can't put arrows above them. They don't count. If I put, if there was a decimal place there, then all of a sudden they do count. But that's the tricky thing. Not just adding dots just to try and help things out. We don't want to do that. So, let's try it out. First one we'll do together, then we'll kind of uh, stop and then re, uh, have you have an opportunity. Those of you that are there virtually, please respond to me privately with your response on how many significant digits they are when I ask for them. So the first one would be 10,830. I have three green arrows. I have a zero between there. So I have to count that one. Do I have a decimal? No. Because I don't have a decimal, that zero on the end does not count. So therefore, my answer is four Sig figs. For part B, write down the number. Those of you that are virtually, privately message me your answer. Those of you that are in class, I'll walk around and see what your answer is. For B, We have the two is the first one. The six counts. Then I need to be reminded of my meaning the zeros in front of the two are to the left. They do not count. Now we have to decide that zero on the at the end. That's where the dot right comes in. And that's the chocolate on the bottom of the cookie. You might not think of it as a very significant part of the cookie, but it is. So we have three arrows. Three sig figs. The other ones should be also fairly straightforward after the first two examples. Looking at what we have, 
Zeros between non-zeros. The Oreo rule, right? <clears throat> and then every now and then you get Oreos that have been dipped in chocolate, right? Those are just a crazy thing. Because it's to the right of a non-zero. And the last one is actually your easiest one. It just has one. 